Hey everyone, I'm Trent Custers, co-founder and studio director at League of Geeks, and this is the Game Maker's Notebook. Today I've been talking with Adam Vian and Tom Vian, brothers and founders of SFB Games. They've most recently released Crow Country, a survival horror sort of PS1 style demake, and it's an exceptional video game, one of my favorite games of the year. I do recommend you check it out. But we talk about how these two brothers started playing video games at a young age and it quickly went from a pastime to a creative outlet and how they found their way to releasing animations and eventually games on new grounds, how the criticism and the culture of very terse and direct reviews <laughs> built this desire for them to continually improve their craft and how that improvement led to a sponsorship deal with Armour Games that resulted in 30 plus games and how there's this hallmark of them finding themselves in the right place at the right time. Like for example, the Switch launch title, Snip Eclipse, which was a DICE award winner in 2018 to Family Game of the Year and Indie Game of the Year, and their special collaborative relationship with Nintendo on that game. Then of course we dive into Crow Country, we spend a bunch of time talking about that. We talk about Adam's mission to find the space between the gaminess of Resident Evil and the dread of Silent Hill. And then of course we talk about the secrets to making a game look and feel like how we remember as opposed to what they actually may look and feel like on those platforms and the times we were playing them. Then we wrap up the podcast chatting about their long running series, Detective Grimoire, and its upcoming entry, The Mermaid Mask. These two brothers of SFB Games have made literally hundreds of games in the 20 years that they've been making games together. And I think there is no better conversation or no better game on display recently or made this year that showcases that exact thing, how going through the pitch to ship process and making a ton of games can make you not only fantastic at making games, but articulating your process and what it is that's helping you achieve the success that you are. So please enjoy. It's a wonderful conversation. They're lovely guys and they were so generous with their time and sharing their story. Have fun. Adam, Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much for having Thanks. us. Thanks for having us. I love, I love saying the podcast. It's kind of ominous. Could be. It's like the capital <laughs> of the podcast. Game Make, welcome to Game Maker's Notebook. It's really, really good to have you guys on. I'm really excited for this chat. Um, Adam, before we dove on just now, we're having a bit of a talk about your <laughs> your long history making games. You guys started off as teenagers, right? Yeah, yeah. young teenagers. Adam was, <laughs> you're 14, I think. I was, I was I was 14. seventeen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, look, um, you know, for those no spoilers, but for those who are listening and not looking at the video and all three of our handsome faces, these guys are not nineteen and sixteen. So like fourteen and seventeen was a few years ago. And we're we're gonna go all the way back, which is how we usually start this podcast, right? How did you first get into playing games like what's your earliest memory of playing games what's that moment when some spark went off in your brain and video games became a little something more than just just entertainment adam why don't you why don't you start us off there do you have an early memory of video games something special I, so our childhood was defined by playing sonic on the mega drive so when i think about playing games as a kid that's what it was i was tails tom was sonic 
Um, you know, I, I had the little, little brother syndrome and it worked out just fine. Um, so that's what we, we had a Mega Drive and we played it a lot and we were obsessed with it. Echo the Dolphin, Sonic the Hedgehog, Dynamite Heady. And then we also had a ZX Spectrum, which is a bit more specific to yeah, wow. the British game scene, I suppose, mm-hmm. which is one of those lovely computers where you have a, the games are on tape and you have to <laughs> put them in a tape deck. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we played a lot of video games growing up. We were obsessed with Sonic and various other things. But I, I definitely didn't know what they were for a long time. I didn't know. I wasn't thinking, oh, this could be a job. Like yeah. that did not occur to me until many years later. I think. Right. I think the moment that thing. spark happened for, of, oh, anyone can make a game. Games are made by human beings. I think that probably happened during the PlayStation One era when we would get demo discs from the magazines. Yes, and they would include occasionally on them. A Net Yeruze games, which is the sort of publicly available dev kit for PlayStation 1. Oh. And I was vaguely made aware that, hey, these Net Yeruze games have been made by some rando and they're quite small. And isn't that interesting? And I, was, I think that was probably the light bulb moment for me was like, oh, okay. Now we were nowhere near being able to afford or, or use a Net Yeruze system. So we weren't making anything yet. But I think that was hmm. probably the moment that I realized, oh, this is a thing you can do. Tom, is that similar for you? Like those those memories? Do they do they mirror Adam's? Or I think you're three. Are you three, two or three years older than Adam? Yeah, three years older. Yeah. Three years. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we had this ZX Spectrum, which had the ability to, uh, you know, w- when you load it up, it doesn't load up an operating system or a game. Mm. It loads up a, a text editor, and you can start typing your own game at that point. Yeah. But strangely, I never did. <laughs> um, I, I only ever, uh, loaded up tape games from there. Um, at school, we had something called Q basic, which mm-hmm. was loaded into all windows, 95 computers, I think, or 3.1, maybe, um, maybe both. And that had games built in, but they also came with the source code. And so I was fiddling around with source code for video games quite early on but it still didn't click that oh this is something you could do as a job or even as a hobby it was just something to do on a wet wet Mm. playtime is go and play on the computers and open up gorillas and change the color of the gorillas by changing the code um yeah (laughs) it 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 sort of didn't slide into place i think uh, yeah the net Eurose stuff where people were making real games where from scratch you could tell mm. like they were you know they made the art they made the sound they made the programming all of that stuff from scratch it wasn't just sort of doing mods to very basic games yeah that was the point you realize yeah, oh it's funny you, that i you think there was basically a, nothing i think there was a bedroom coders like community around the spectrum mm. and mm-hmm. Some of the people that made Spectrum games went on to be figures in the industry, in the British industry, but we were too young. So we had to kind of wait for the next bedroom coder revolution, which would happen in our teens. Well, that was actually going to be one of my next questions because you're right, Adam, the Spectrum is a kind of strangely British experience. Like it it seems to be a through line through, because, you know, we ask the same question of many of the devs that are on this podcast and it seems to be you know, common to the British experience growing up playing games. I remember talking to Sam Barlow on this podcast, you know, of her story and immortality. And one of his memories was the spectrum and trading games at school and stuff with people. Uh, Did you ever, did you ever get into that side of things as well? Like, even if you weren't making your own, were you sort of trading or, you know, from the flea markets getting like homebrew spectrum games or anything? No, I mean, we were, we were young, young at this point. When we were playing the spectrum, it was sort of in our, I don't know. I was, I would have been eight or nine. So yeah, I would have yeah. been six. Yeah. I don't uh, think you knew anyone else with, with the Spectrum. <laughs> no, no. Cause it wasn't, it was our dad's Spectrum. Like he, yep. he had yeah. one because he was a slightly tech savvy adult, but it wasn't <laughs> our, it wasn't our Spectrum that we had. And then we would then yeah. operate as if it was ours. So yeah, it was a slightly different experience. Um, sort of a glancing blow in, into the, spectrum world really mm. but then no sorry continue don't know go on yeah and so 
it's interesting, right? Because we're here, we're going to talk, you've just released Crow Country. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> I was talking to you guys on Twitter about how fantastic the game is. I'm just so, it's it's one of my favorite games I've played this year. It's so special. But there's something uniquely console about the experience. There's no other way to put it, right? It's like it has a lot of influences and in the, you know, from console games. I'm interested to know if you're a game playing, you know, you spoke about the PS1, Adam. Like, Tom, did you have a... Did the spectrum then sort of evolve with your tech, tech savvy adult father into, you know, your Windows home PCs and were you PC gaming along along the side? Was there like modding or even yeah. map making in Age of Empires or anything? No, like no, no modding. Again, um, this is sort of all pre-internet and or at least pre-internet in our house. We had a we had internet fairly early, I'd say, for the UK. Mm. But we certainly never found our way into that sort of community. Um, we were definitely PC gaming, though. A lot of LucasArts titles um, mm-hmm. <laughs> around that time. And uh, even earlier stuff, like uh, we, we played quite a few Dizzy the Egg games, which are on the Spectrum, but also on the PC. There were DOS versions of those games as well. Um, Tom, the game I remember you playing the most was all the Sim games, like Sim Tower and Sim Ant and Sim. Yeah, absolutely. The old Maxis Maxis games. games. (laughs) Yeah, Um, yeah, absolutely. I I put thousands of hours into uh, Sim Tower, I think. Um, So, yeah, we we were definitely doing that alongside. But, again, didn't find our way into the creative side of it. Um, Weirdly, I think I was thinking about this the other day, and I, I think we can trace the origins of our video game making back to a CD-ROM game that we had. Oh, I know what you're going to say. (laughs) The Spider-Man Animation Comic Maker. I don't know what it's actually called, but it allowed you to make animated comic strips or sort of animated cartoon sequences with the graphics based on the animated Spider-Man series that was out at the time in the 90s. And you could sort of sequence these things together and tell little stories and animations. And that was definitely our first sort of really creative use of a, of a computer to start telling stories. And that sort of got us into finding other programs you could animate in. And then eventually we came across Flash, which <laughs> was, we were only interested originally because it let you animate things mm-hmm. and not just animate things, but put those animations on the internet. Yeah. Which, you know, we were just doing this in our living room and sharing them with each other. And that was I mean, it. When would this be? I imagine point? this thinking about your ages, like this would have been like at the height of Newgrounds time as well, right? So 2001 is when we first got hold of a copy of Flash, I think. And yeah, 2002 exactly. is when we first put anything out on on new grounds um mm. so yeah it was it was the uh, the early days of the height of new grounds for sure like there was, was this a, the, was a um, lot of activity was this the advent of the super flash bros it, yeah it was so we started i think we signed up for the account right you know just before we put our first thing on the internet which um I can't. I can't remember what went up first. I guess it would have been your animation, Adam. The or no, it was our animation where you did the art mm-hmm. and I animated, and that came out badly because I am no animator. Um, yeah, I had so the first thing was, roles early on. In I had to have something to do. I had to have something to do, and I couldn't program yet. So, yeah. well, yeah. Tom, Tom did the animation. And I just drew the character models because I didn't know how to use the program beyond that. But it was called Metal Gear Mayhem, and it was a Metal Gear Solid parody. Um, very much inspired by the work of Joseph Blanchett, a.k.a. Legendary Frog, who was kind of the guy on Newgrounds that we were inspired by. It was very direct. We saw his stuff. We were like, that's cool as hell. Let's try to do that. And we eventually became buddies with him and worked with him. So (laughs) got what we wanted for sure. Yeah, that community, you know, it's it's a similar story too of like the the Newgrounds and the Flash community in those early days. a, a friend of mine, um, Talon Strauss Bayer, uh, made a, a scary girl, Nathan Jerovicious game. But like at the time, you know, it was all flash and everything. And I remember him talking about like very quickly finding himself in rooms alongside the, the his heroes of Newgrounds and like the, the mm-hmm. flash crowd and everything. It, it seemed like a pretty, you know, as much as big as the platform was, it seemed like a wonderfully sort of small community in the best of ways in some. Did you find, did you find that? Like tell me about your early experiences being, because what you're, 
you're like in your mid teens now or something, right? Like, and you're, yeah. you're making animation. How did that, how did you find that first putting something out into the world on a, on a platform and then, you know, and then what was the sort of progression towards, it seems like an inevitability, <laughs> just talking to you guys for a little bit, but towards that becoming game making on new grounds. Sure. So the Newgrounds community was very much part of that uh, part of the internet where uh, I'd say harshness is is encouraged or at least respected. You can sort of say what you want in in reviews and forum posts, and and no one really minds. There was no sort of oh, you have to be kind to each other. It was you have to speak your mind. And sometimes that, you know, leads all the way up to straight, like, I think your animation is bad, so you should die in a fire sort of things. <clears throat> and it, it was, you know, less moderated than than a modern iteration of it might be, and probably yeah. less moderated than the modern Newgrounds is. Um, so you got all sorts of things on, on those early reviews. And... Yeah it was very encouraged to leave reviews. So you got a lot of them, even for mm. small stuff. Yeah. Um, so that sort of trial by fire of putting things out there and having unfiltered hose of people's opinions thrown yeah. straight at you, it's quite formative. Totally. Um, and especially in those years as well, like it's not just a, it wasn't just a new grounds thing. I think like the internet in and of itself was kind of figuring those things out, even just figuring out yeah. that, people had the capacity for doing that in an online forum, you know, when you give them some anonymity or a, or a handle. Adam, do you remember those early days, especially being a little bit younger than Tom? Do you remember what that was like, sort of? Rude? Yeah, I mean, did, did it fire all, you it up and make you want to do more, like, do more and improve or did it knock you around a bit? No, I mean, it, it was amazing. It was very thrilling just on a base level to put something online and knowing that people were going to see it because we, we went from like, you know, having no audience to suddenly having this potentially large audience. And it was just at the click of a button. It was amazing. It was very mm. exciting to put up something on Newgrounds. Like submitting something to Newgrounds was the most exciting thing you'd do in that month. You know, it was very thrilling. But mm. yeah, like Tom says, the the culture of reviews and stuff, I actually think it was one of our secret weapons in terms of our formative years because we basically got accelerated through the process of feeling like we had to improve. Um, because we put stuff online, it would get criticized. People would call out what was bad about it. It was like being in a, like a hyperbolic time chamber of, of criticism and, and improvement <laughs> where I think we went through. And also the fact that we were making stuff that was quick, you know, we'd make a movie or a game in, in a week or two or a month, and then we'd get loads of feedback on it. And then we'd make another one. And like that process now, if you were an indie dev let's say that could take years and years and years so i think we got really lucky to sort of be in this amazing bubble of of feedback and criticism and also encouragement from peers and we came out of it like kind of accelerated development in terms of knowing what you wanted to make mm. knowing what was good what people liked what they didn't like it was it was wonderful i'm right. very grateful for the whole thing i think one of the hardest issues facing modern developers just starting out is getting any eyeballs on your work any at all yeah. you know you can put you can put your game up on steam but how do you get people to look at it well, steam isn't built for put something in like uh, upload something and then eyes come to it you have to send eyes to your page on steam and then steam goes oh maybe i should show this to other people but you have to do that initial spark of getting people there in the first place otherwise it just won't be shown same thing with itch itch is slightly better for that sort of Start from start from nothing and just go. Okay, here's something, and it will get seen in some places on that store. And there's a community yeah. of people there, sort of looking at those new submissions. But Newgrounds was, you put something up, and you're guaranteed 200 eyeballs on it, minimum. Because after 200 views, 200 votes, uh, if it's good enough, it stays. If it's bad enough, it gets blammed, gets deleted off the website. And there was, and so th it gamified that whole thing for the users. And so there were a lot of users just hanging out in the new list. And the new list was, you know, quite front and center where you could just go, okay, what is literally been uploaded in the last 10 seconds? Let's have a look. <laughs> and so you would get, you know, you get your initial 200 and then you stick around and you get 
sort of up and up the what's what's highly voted today and you get thousands of views and then tens and then hundreds of thousands eventually and sometimes millions in our case which um yeah i never really thought about it but at the time that was a lot of <laughs> internet users yeah yeah so if anybody yeah, even by today's randomly, standards um, right? if anybody randomly is a uh follows h bomber guy he he put up a video recently it's on, i think it's just on his patreon but it's, it's about patreon the new ground so, scene yeah. and it's very much about us and our peers and he has to reiterate several times like oh look at the numbers on these videos just so you know, this was insane back in the day. Yeah. Like 2002, a million views was was unbelievable. Yeah, you know right. now now a YouTube video with a million views, you don't even blink. No. But back in the day, yeah, it was a whole different thing. So yeah, some of the numbers that we got on our stuff back, like I, I remember feeling frustrated that we weren't able to keep that audience all the time going forward into other work because it's like. Where are all those people that used to play our new grand stuff? Can we get them to play our, you know, game on the App Store or game on Steam or whatever? Where have they gone? <laughs> so let's let's talk about games and new grounds because I know that, you know, and tell me if I'm wrong here, but a, a big break for you guys on new grounds was the partnership with Armor Games, right? Yeah. So maybe like Adam, you can tell us a little bit about that. Like how how did that come about, and how far into the game making process on um, on new grounds were you when that opportunity came along? Um, so we made we made games as just purely as a hobby for a few years, um, just for the fun of it, and no money changed hands, and it was just for fun. And then we made a um, we made a game called Blue Rabbit's Climate Chaos, which was a very ambitious three D adventure game, the, by far the most ambitious thing we'd made at the time, and it was turning out pretty good. And we were like, oh, what we want is music. We want music for our game. We'd never thought about that before. And it was suddenly a question of, okay, so what do we do? We have to, I guess, hire a composer. Okay, we haven't got any money. We're teenagers. What do we do? <laughs> and the answer was, well, what do people do on, on Newgrounds? They get sponsorship, I guess. So we looked at the sponsorship and Armour Games was the most prominent ones. It was just a very kind of basic through line of, okay, we'd like to be able to pay one guy to write music for one game so we need sponsorship to do that so we spoke to armor games and it was a quite a straightforward like yeah cool all you have to do is put a link on your main menu that says armorgames.com and then amusingly a second link that says play more games that also goes to armorgames.com <laughs> um, that was the format for many years and that was pretty much it so uh, no strings attached that was just like slap that on your main menu it becomes an armor games sponsored thing and you get a certain amount of money. And when you're a teenager, you know, any amount of money from is, is very exciting. So suddenly right. we were like, oh, wow, this is... And, we, you know, our first one, we were able to pay pay the composer to write music for Climate Chaos. But then obviously it was like, oh, this is cool. We're going to keep doing this, um, making more games with Armour Games. And now we have a reason to keep doing it because they're going right. to be happy to pay us for it. Because this Am was... right in saying, Tom, that you ended up doing about 34 Flash games? With I games? think uh, mm, I, maybe in total, I think Adam ended up doing more than I did because Adam right. did do some Armour Game games yeah. with uh, other programmers just right. because uh, – so this, this all started out uh, – right after I got home from university, I did a, a physics degree and had no idea what to do with it. All my friends had gone into banking. I did not want to do that. So I was home from university and Adam being three years younger would have been just starting university, but you did a, a foundation year, which is sort of like a first year art foundation at a local university. So Adam oh. was still at home as well. So we had this year period where we were both at home I hadn't gone and gotten a real job yet. Uh, I hadn't moved out of the house. I'd, I'd come back from London and was was staying in our home. And um, we just thought, what should we do? Oh, let's let's start making games again. But but both of us had gotten better at our respective things in the time that I'd been off at university, mm -hmm. and so we were able to make this slightly larger, more ambitious game than we had before in Climate Chaos. And then when that paid off, literally, it was kind of an obvious thing to to fill the time like i was i was job hunting but it was uh, a case of well might as well do this in the gap mm -hmm. um it wasn't fabulously lucrative but it certainly you know 
thousands of dollars better than nothing. Um, <laughs> of the year. It sounds then, like a streets lyric or something. Right. <laughs> and then eventually I did get a job and moved away and we carried on making games together then. But obviously there were times where I was busier and Adam was, uh, had gone away to proper university. And so your busyness ebbed and flowed, but sometimes you were more free and able to work with other yes, programmers. I, I designed all the levels for a game called Crush the Castle, which I, to this day, I believe slightly predates Angry Birds and is the exact same genre. <laughs> and um, I like to be bitter about the fact that we were almost the Angry Birds. You know, they, <laughs> Angry they about not being there. the Angry Bird, yeah. Yes, that's me, yeah. I designed all the levels for that, and um, maybe not all of them, but most of them. And I got paid to do it. It was literally just like, here's the level editor. Um, Tom, am I right in saying that I think our deal with Armour Games, and this is going to sound ridiculous now, <laughs> was two games a month? Yes, but one and big, one small. One big one in quotes and one small one and mm -hmm. that now is insane to me yeah. because games take five six years to make let's be honest right well, they do yeah. um, but our small games would take a weekend and our large games yeah. would take two weeks and this was right. all you know in our spare time Isn't that crazy though i can't even imagine wrapping something up in two weeks <laughs> that would be a dream wow i would love to get back to that you <laughs> How'd you go, oh, visitor? visitor. Um, so, li like, let's let's dive into that for a second because it's really interesting, right? Like, I mean, I, as a developer myself, I I know the answer, but I'm interested to just like ruminate on for a bit. Like, why do you think it was so so rapid to make games back in those days? Was it was the scope, the production values, the tool set? Was was it what 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 was it? What were you? Well, I mean, how is getting these games up in a weekend? It's still kind of the secret we have is, you know, there's, we, there's just two of us. We know what the other one is thinking. We know what we want to make. We get started straight away. We don't really have meetings. We just kind of get on with it. We just kind of sit down and start making something. I mean, they were very small games, but, you know, I'd be drawing the assets while Tom was programming it. And um, there just wasn't much to it. You know, there wasn't much... Um, the system to make Flash games. You make it in Flash, you make the menu, main menu in Flash, you make the, the ending sequence in Flash. It's all just right there. Um, it's, But it is still crazy to me. I still don't quite understand because a reality of game development is even if you're making the world's most simple game, there's always a secret 10% at the end of the project that's the secret 90%, <laughs> which takes a yeah. year, right? Yeah. And so we just made games that were simple enough where that just wasn't the case. Mm. And also... The real secret to why Flash games were put out quickly is they were easy to publish. So you make a file, you just export the file from Flash, and then you just upload that one file to Newgrounds. Whereas nowadays, if you want to put it on Steam or on a console, there's a whole rigmarole of stuff yeah, right. in and stuff you've got to do. Yeah, because it was sort of in immediate mode, because the the Flash file was just right there to play in the browser. As soon as you opened up that page, you could just hit play, go. Yeah. The game itself served as its own trailer, as its own artwork. These days, mm. you have to take screenshots, make a trailer. You don't need that if you can just play the game, right? Yeah, it's as good as hitting play on a thumbnail you, right, video anyway, right? You don't have to be sold on the game because you can just play it <laughs> at no cost with no investment. And if you don't like it, you hit back on your browser and you play another one. So mm -hmm. the the upload process was, as Adam said, upload the Swift file, the little the output file, which, you know, our larger games pushed a couple of megabytes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's pre-broadband, pre so, you know, that would take uh, about half an hour to upload. And whilst that's uploading, you could write your description and your title of the thing, and that's it, done. One description, one title, and you, and then you're live. So it was, <laughs> I think, <laughs> the, the quickest game we made was in 14 hours. We did it in one day. Yeah. That was the, the Deep Sea Zebra? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, James, the deep, the deep Sea Zebra, where you just dive down a big hole in the, in the ocean and then come back up, I think. And it was just like, dodge the rocks and grab the gems, you know, like very basic stuff. But we made it fun.
it's so amazing how much new grounds as well and so many of those mechanics like obviously they're not being explored in the pc or console market at the time but there was such a precursor to what would inevitably find their way onto the app store which is probably a great segue into tell us about adam tell us about sfb and how that all came about and you know pivoting from you know, new grounds into, um, into yeah, so to delay the groundwork. We had a quite a popular flash game called haunt the house, which was a game where you play as a little ghost floating around a doll's house and you scare people. So we had that, that was kind of our hit. And then anyway, we went to a game jam, a big organized game jam event, uh, it's somewhere in London. I think it was that the one in Pinewood studios. Anyway, it was in Pinewood um, studios where they make James Bond. Yeah. And Harry Potter. Yeah. And we weren't allowed to wander off because there were security guards, because there were sets. <laughs> anyway, um, we made a game there called Monkey King Spring, which honestly was not that great, but it was hey, kind come of, on now. it was good enough because somehow we won the game jam. There was a prize and we won it. And several prizes, one of the as- won several prizes. With several prizes. One of the aspects of the prize was um, like, you get to talk to Sony <laughs> Is that right? Like, you, well, so no, it was uh, the prize was a PlayStation Vita dev kit. Okay, oh, yeah. Was, so Sony was there. A representative of Sony was there, not for the full forty-eight hours because that would have been very boring for them. But they came along <laughs> at the end and they judged the games at the presentation stage. And um, yeah, the prize was a dev kit, which we never received. No. Um, <laughs> also- no. All right, Sony, if you're listening, we want that kind of dev kit. <laughs> right. Especially on a shelf somewhere, marked with our name, surely. Um, <laughs> but so it came with this dev kit, and then that led us to talking to them uh, through our friend Ricky Haggett, from, now from Hollow Ponds, who yes. did Hohokam and recently The Amazing Looking Flock. Um, he said, oh, I know this other guy at Sony, you're about to get a Vita dev kit, right? Cool. I know this other guy at Sony who's looking for small independent developers, just like you guys, to make something for this new thing they have coming up on the Vita. Do you want to have an intro? And so we got that intro, and turns out this was for a program called PlayStation Mobile, which was a short-lived platform where you could make games in C Sharp, so not the normal way you'd make a PlayStation game had a special tool set for it and those games would then work both on playstation vita in its own special section but also on sony xperia phones Mm. um i don't know if you remember that phone that had the pop-out game controller that was one of the that was one of the phones but also it would work just on other xperia phones with like a touchscreen controller set up just automatically you didn't have to think about it you didn't have to test it it would just be guaranteed to work on those phones and they were looking for people to make content for that and they had some small amounts of funding available to to do that and so we said absolutely and they asked us hey yeah. you know we, we just sort of want you to make something that you want to make so what do you want to make and uh we said well let's make another haunt the house because at the time that was our most successful flash game right mm-hmm. yeah so we we made haunt the house terror town which is effectively a big old sequel to haunt the house with a lot more content but yeah, I, it's going to come up again later. But this, the, what Tom just described there is something that it kind of defines our career where, where we find ourselves in the right place at the right time where somebody, some platform holder or distributor or publisher is hungry for content because they're at the beginning of a new platform. Mm. And we have been lucky multiple times with that exact thing. And, and having more experience in the industry now, I know that like on the other side of that equation is how difficult it can be to, to find someone to, you know, publish your game or whatever. But we were so lucky to, to find, for instance, Sony when they were like, yes, anything. Yes. Just give us games. We want to fill up PlayStation yeah. mobile. Give us what you got. And that happened at least twice more for us. So we've been quite lucky there. Um, but yeah. So PlayStation mobile, that the haunt the house was on there. We always felt like it wasn't very, very well supported every year. We'd watch E3 and really hope that they would talk about it, and they sort of never did. And it always felt like Sony disagreed with themselves about how much they should push it. Anyway, that's... Sure, cool. but not, E3 not really now. is why we are SFP Games, because yes. the year that they announced PlayStation Mobile was right after we'd signed with them to, to make this game. We hadn't, we hadn't made it yet, so we didn't have mm-hmm. content to show. But they wanted to announce this platform to the public, and... When they did, they wanted a, a you know good old 
wall of partner logos for all the, all the development studios. And they were like, okay, give us your studio logo. And we were like, oh, we're not a studio yet. Oh, because, you know, we we were just sort of individuals making stuff as, as in the UK, it's called a sole trader where you're just sort of your own freelance person. Yep. But they, they were like, oh yeah, no, you need to be a business. Um, you need to have a business name and a business logo and we need it in three days, go. Um, so we sort of panicked a bit and that's why we just went for a simplified Super Flash Bros down to SFB because oh, of course, yeah, just to avoid copyright issues. Um, and Adam threw together the logo nice and quickly and we sent it off and then that was it. It just, we, we didn't think to revise it at any later stage. We no, like, well, that's it. Tom, I, I remember I was, I was walking along outside somewhere on the street and you called me and said, Oh, we need to be a company. So is SFB games okay? Should we go with that? And I was like, yeah, uh, yeah cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, it's that's so funny though. Like, has you know, an uncool name. Funnily enough, like League of Geeks, our company name, I, I, I hate it. And I've hated it for many years. Like it's um because we we founded the company before Gamergate and all this sort of stuff. Like when we founded it, it was like people reclaiming their like geekiness and nerdness and we we're trying to like be in vogue. And then when Gamergate happened, we were all like, oh, we don't want to be geeks anymore. Or like, you know, there was a gamer identity and a culture that kind of surrounded that in a negative way. And it just kind of oh, felt yeah. corny. But we we looked at renaming ourselves a couple of times, but you're like, after a while, you're like, the company name takes on a, comp- like, what does Coca-Cola mean? Or like, what is KFC? Right. Yeah. Or, like, it, you so know, I, like- actually, I actually don't like our company name. I think it's boring and hard to remember. But I, I've kind of grown to appreciate that over the years. People say SBF or SPF. Yeah, like, okay. They always say that because it's like, that, it's, SPF is a thing. It's like sunscreen, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, so, but one thing I noticed is a lot of game companies will go too far in the other direction where mm. they're clearly a startup and they'll have a, an overly cool, overly ambitious sounding like name with the word studios mm. underneath it. Yeah. And that makes me kind of recoil slightly. And I'm, I'm, I always think to myself, at least we didn't do that. You know, at least our company name is kind of humble in the, in how boring and dry it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not good, but it's not bad either. So, eh. And, it becomes um, a semiotic in a way, like after a while where you're just like, yeah. it just is a symbol that means you two guys and the games that you make with your fantastic collaborators. It'll, it'll like that's what well. it means to people over the time, right? But I think it, it's interesting to see. We've had this exact experience with our last three releases of um, people not realizing, even when they play the game, see our logo in the game, buy it from our store that has the, you know, the label on it saying it's made by these people. Then down the line, they find out Oh, that was made by these guys who made this other thing. I know. Right. I think it's because so, we keep completely changing genre, so the people. Well, <laughs> no right. One can keep up. Yeah, you're jumping around a bit. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like we got, you know, Snipperclips was like, oh, those are the guys who made Haunt the House, and then Tangled Tower. Those are the guys who made Snipperclips, and then Crow Country. <laughs> yes, <Beat. everyone. laughs> those are the guys who made Snipperclip. I mean, that stuck yeah, around. Right. So fair I'm enough. Making it hard for you. I mean, well, yeah. I, I I know what you mean. It's it's interesting how you can it's also interesting like a lot of developers um don't think about building a following like you know say musicians might or bands might um or mm. even artists might but you know like a lot of game devs we just make games and we you know make twitter accounts for those games or whatever but we don't try and build followings really around our studio right. but it is something yeah. that obviously has a you know huge immense immense help to us so i think ho- hopefully, I've been- <laughs> hopefully they start to get the picture very soon like i'm sure like yeah. crow countries put help put you guys on the map a little bit more for yeah. like you know i think yeah. we I, I certainly was actively put off building or maintaining any sort of community ourselves mm. um when we did so there's a there's a missing piece of the puzzle here which was pre sfb in 2010, Armor Games said, hey, do you want to make a mobile game? Mm-hmm. Um, we'd had our successful Flash game called Detective Grimoire in 2008. In 2010, they said, do you want to make a sequel but make it for mobile? Because at the time, Flash had just gotten the ability to publish for mobile, and it was very bad. It was it ran mm-hmm. very slowly. You had to do very simple things with it. It didn't have hardware acceleration yet. It was trying to run a Flash player on a mobile, which didn't work great, but it was possible for the first time. Yep. And so we 
we said, absolutely, this sounds great. And we ended up running a small Kickstarter for it, which at the time you couldn't even do in the UK. So Armor Games had to sort of have the account, but we, en- oh, you know, we ran it essentially like they gave us the login for it yep. it was under cool. the this was in name. the honeymoon period of kickstarter not that long right. after double fine yeah. adventure I, I right say. so this there's a gold rush to to kickstarter of like okay this is where you can make some money if if you know what you're doing and we didn't know what we were doing but we got funded um i think it was what thirty thousand dollars total cool. in the end and we were very silly with our choice of rewards. We ended up offering eight different t-shirt designs in four different sizes. God, and you so, weren't the only ones in that period. No. They were the hard lessons learned in that Kickstarter yeah, we call. we did not sure. know. So most talked of to some money, of the devs who like gave away, you know, spend a day with us at the studio or something or design oh, yeah. a character for our game. <laughs> yeah, how that went down. You know? So most of that money ended up going on those on those backer rewards. But anyway, mm-hmm. we we ended up with, you know, a few thousand people who were then invested in following the progress of the game. This was the first time this had happened in this later stage of us making games. We were just, there was, there was a disconnect on new grounds of like, Oh, these are the people in the comment section. That's fine. But they weren't, they couldn't come to where we live. They, they couldn't email us. They couldn't, yeah. you know what I mean? Whereas Kickstarter is very much, they, they could email us. They could message us on this thing directly and most of the folks there are absolutely lovely, but a few of them, rightly or wrongly, were like, where is it? Where is it? And the mm-hmm. game had to start again from scratch at some point because Flash mobile porting got better. And so I had to rewrite the whole thing when when they introduced a new way to do it. Mm-hmm. And so that game came out, you know, this was kickstarted in 2010. That game came out in 2014, January 2014. Yeah. So about three and a half years of, of development on that. Hmm. And there was this just unpleasant pressure that whole time because we had people hanging around watching what we were doing. Yeah. Waiting sort for of, things. Right. It sort of put me off the idea of, of having that as a permanent present in our presence in our development process. Like a really um, engaged and active community. Yeah. Like I, I know some developers yeah. absolutely thrive on that. And mm. that gives them the energy, whereas I'm more to the please do not perceive me <laughs> end of development. Like, yeah. don't look at me. I'll like, I'll come out of our development cave in three years' time and, and hopefully bring you a shiny present. But until then, I'm happy yeah. to just sort of linger away in the shadows. Mm. Do you guys have, like, what's your sort of thoughts on community now? Because you're right, like, it's totally part of... You know, there are some processes at studios where, you know, Unknown Worlds is one of the classics, right, where their community are very involved and it's very transparent, right? There are Trello boards for their sprints or whatever they might be using. <laughs> you know, they're online and people can view what's happening at any point in time. You know, at least that's how Subnautica was done for a long time. Like, how are you guys now with your, do you find that you're starting to build a bit of a community around your games or around SFB itself? Or are you still like, no, we're cool. We're just going to keep making our games and we're going to bring those shiny presents every few years. Well, we still don't have a centralized location. Like we've had, I've had people message me recently saying, why isn't there an SFB games discord I can join? Mm. Because I want to sit in there and talk about your games. Right. Uh, but then the other day I saw a tweet from someone saying, oh, I can't believe how many bloody game dev discords <laughs> there are that they expect you to join these days. It's so annoying. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't want to add another one to that list. Um, but so in recent times we've had because of crow country we've had a little you know bubble of community on the steam discussion boards Mm. and there's a reddit for it and also there's a discord server for the speedrunners which i'm in so those three combined is a lot for me because i'm I'm sort of introverted and, and i like quiet private time on the internet so i don't want to be chatting to people all the time and i feel like running up to crow country's release and then having since released it I've kind of had my fill and I have to then back away again where I, mm. I enjoy being part of an online community a bit, but then I'm kind of like, okay, I really just need to go and be quiet now. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I, I work much better when I'm not engaging with feedback. Um, like I just, I would rather work in the dark. Like I've never read any of the Tangle Tower reviews on Steam because it's too painful. Sounds so there like are you're still aspects. digesting Newgrounds reviews anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, sometimes I just can't, I can't look at it. It's like staring into the sun, you know, 
Like every day someone's got a complaint or, or maybe not a complaint, maybe it's, you know, a compliment, but it's, it's too much information and I just kind of have to block it out after a while. Mm -hmm. We do both have pretty decent Twitter accounts and that was our primary location online where I can post screenshots and stuff and we get nice feedback feedback and responses right. on that but yeah I, I we're really both at the pieces we're both at the like nice end of, of of followers on on twitter i think we're both around 10k at this point where yeah, cool. it's not a horrible flood of millions of people like if you have sort of tens and tens of thousands of followers you start to really get a hose pipe of people i've almost but, got 18k but you know oh what well, you fancy fancy lad um <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it, it's not that sort of. Oh, you can't even look at your feed anymore because it's just too much. It it, mm. uh, it got very busy right around Crow Country launch, and that was pleasant, uh, like a nice thing to yeah, have yeah. where yeah. your your Twitter notifications just constantly going off. It was like, oh, that's that's nice. But then it yeah. went away again, and that was also nice. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, so more think, sometimes you know that a sweet spot. Like- more power to you. There's multiple paths to success and community community building and brand building, like, you know, generating and engaging with these large communities is one of those paths. And then there's also the, like, that survivor bias too of often the people who are spruiking that as a path to success are these extroverted people who have built their own communities and everything anyway. You're, the introverts aren't standing up and saying, don't worry about community. You don't, <laughs> I've had success with that, <laughs> right. you know, focusing yeah. on that or, you know, laying myself upon the pyre of the masses to be perceived. Um all right, well, look, I'm keen to, I really love that little detour, but I'm keen to talk a little bit about Snipper Clips and your Detective Grimoire series before we dive into Crow Country, right? Mm, so, yeah. and Snipper Clips was another one of those beautiful happenstance luck moments where you guys were ready and poised with a little concept because it was a Switch launch title, right? And it sounded like That's you right. had quite a special relationship with Nintendo as well, which kind of differed a little bit from your standard publisher relationship that most people have. So... Adam, tell us a, tell us a little bit about Snipper Clips and your your relationship with Nintendo through that. Well, so we we'd met a rep from Nintendo at um, a convention when we were showing other games, and we had his business card, and we'd run a couple of games very briefly up the Wii U, pitching flagpole, and nothing had come of it. But so we, we had a connection, you know, with um, a guy from Nintendo Europe, and then we Tom and I made Friend Shapes, which was our little prototype. Um, of the what would eventually become snippet clips it was called friendships originally and we had that and we were like oh this is a a, a couch co-op game it's a colorful family-friendly puzzle game we should pitch this to publishers and then obviously oh well in theory this is the kind of thing nintendo would like so we have their email well, let's show it to them and um all the indie publishers turned us down and nintendo picked it up so that was a, a fun <laughs> turn of events. They actually said the words something. I, I'm not. I can't remember exactly, but they said something like, "We want to fully fund and publish this game to us." They were they were all in, which is crazy because relationships with publishers they're always trying to edge around commitment. They're always saying like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, we're really interested with, with in working with you guys and seeing what we can make happen." Nintendo were like, "We want to do this," right. Um, which was crazy. I was, it was absolutely not wild. even what we but asked then, for, right? No. Um, but there was a large kind of vetting process after that where they had to make sure we were capable and we could be trusted and all this because we were just two random guys and they had to come visit the site and, and meet us and check, you know, the game had to be approved, everything. There was a lot of hoops to jump through, but we ended up in a second party relationship where it wasn't so much that Nintendo were publishing our indie game, it's that it was a Nintendo game that we were making for them. Um, like it's branded as Nintendo. And SFP Games doesn't even show up on it until you get to the credits roll, I want to say. <laughs> um, so it was a Nintendo game and they own it. So that was very special. And obviously, you know, there are companies where we we might have been hesitant to enter into such a relationship because it, you could argue that we were sort of giving away the idea. But not with Nintendo. We were very happy to do that because they're the coolest people in the world that you could have work with you. Yeah, it's like whatever, whatever you want, Senpai Mario. Like it's (laughs) all (laughs) good, buddy. 
It's cool. So there you were actively collaborating with them. Tom, do you remember what that was like? Were you, I, you know, through the little bit of research that I've done, thanks to the wonderful work of our producers here on the podcast, like, I, am I right in hearing that they did a lot of like the wireframe mockups or, you know, like it was actually almost like co-development to some degree, we, am I correct? Or not? It was definitely <clears throat> co-development. In the, in the early stages, it was us generating ideas. We, we certainly did a lot of sort of paper idea generation as we were building out the engine for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, so we were coming up with ideas and then they were coming up with ideas and we would, it was all just sort of on paper at that point, but there was a lot of thoughts that didn't even make it to the, okay, let's try it out in the engine stage. And mm-hmm. then there were a ton of things that, that, got to that stage and then didn't make it into the full game or there's things that even made it into most of development and then got dropped right near the end. Um, So uh, never to see the light of day, sadly. Um, But they were definitely, you know, it was definitely a collaborative process and they weren't, you know, that they were our producer where they were keeping us on schedule and Mm -hmm. making sure to set the set, you know, what, what we were trying to hit each week, which is super useful because as we said, it was just, you know, it was us. And then we hired a, a, a guy called Danny Gallagher who helped us learn unity. He was a unity programmer, taught oh, us how to use unity at all. We had no idea, but it, you know, cause you couldn't make uh, what we thought was going to be a Wii U game. We couldn't make a Wii U game using Flash, which is the tool we were using up to that point. Even the prototype that we sent them was made in Flash. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn this whole new platform. Danny helped us with that, and he helped build out that early engine and then, you know, was programmer all the way through the project um, with me sort of trying to play programming catch-up. But it was just the three of us initially for the first, what, six months, Adam? Um, No, we hired Catherine pretty soon because we had to go, we had to fly to... America for disclosure. We yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was around, that was around month five, right? Okay. It was sure. after the experimental phase, um, where we sort of proved the concept, but yeah, it, it, being the three of us and just, and, and then the four of us, but we were all yeah. busy making things. So we, none of us could also act as producer. So they, you yeah. know, like having them yeah. as, as the project manager was exceptionally useful. I can imagine then, it's almost like grown-up game development school in some way as well, with Danny and a new pipeline right. and Unity, and then having an actual yeah. games producer on keeping you accountable. And right, you know, exactly. Can- Up until that point, it had largely been me and Adam in a room somewhere making games, bringing Catherine yeah. in occasionally to make fantastic art, yeah. occasionally collaborating. And this is sorry, to jump in, but this is this is Catherine Unger who is um, yeah, sorry, yes. yeah, who's yeah, been on. Everything good we've ever made up until. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I distinctly remember uh, Snippetlets feeling like the first time. It, yeah, it was like big boy mode. It was like, okay, this is real. This is a real job. I have a real grown-up adult responsibility to make this game. There are adults in suits waiting for me to make this game. <laughs> this is amazing. Like I had a real sense of purpose, and probably the worst post-project. Uh, you know, um, depression afterwards because of it, because, you know, you fill up your entire body with purpose and then you finish the project and then you're like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> and you would have been like mid to late twenties, the two of you at this point in time as yeah, well, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah late twenties. So, yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Amazing. And then a launch title for this. When did you find out it was going to be on the switch? Like, is it what it was called the NX or something at that point was, in time? Right. Yeah. So we didn't know it was, and then they, they had to fly us out after we did this initial stage that was like a few months of proving out the idea, making sure it could run in unity, making sure that we, like we tried out some ideas, found the fun as they kept saying. Um, and then they greenlit the full project Mm -hmm. uh, and then they flew us out to nintendo america and showed us a prototype of the thing Mm -hmm. um and no one in the world knew what this was at this point it was like the the, the biggest secret in gaming it was still called the nx even internally still called the nx and still rumored about and no one knew that it was pop-out controllers no one knew it was handheld like uh console hybrid None of this stuff was public, and suddenly we knew it. 
and then they told it. We we always sort of suspected that it was going to be something else. The game. I knew. I there was one clue that gave it away, and um, this is getting into real specifics now. But when we were making the game as a Wii U prototype, I had asked about controller layout, and they said, "Oh, just use two shoulder buttons, not four. One on each side." Yeah. And I remember thinking, "Huh." That's a bit interesting. I wonder why that would be. And then obviously, right, the Wii U gamepad has two on each side. Yeah, the triggers as well. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Well, yeah. What a what a pinch yourself opportunity. That's just absolutely <laughs> yeah. amazing. Um, I will come back to the Detective Grimoire series um, because it's you know obviously it's probably the you know the most substantial through line in your career um, to date. Sure. But I do want to talk about Crow Country. So I've spoken about this a, a little bit on Twitter for our listeners who. You follow me there. Um, but Crow Country is seriously one of the, I don't often gush on the podcast. I was saying to Adam <laughs> when you were changing rooms earlier time before the podcast um, started, but it's one of the best games I've played this year. And it's it does something so special, which is in being so true to its source material and you guys obviously having such a great understanding of its source material, meaning its inspiration and the things that you're obviously paying homage to, coupled with this, you know, this career of making 50 plus games or whatever, whether they be made on a weekend or, you know, a few years with Nintendo, you've obviously got a degree of execution capability where you've not only made an homage to the genre, but you've made one of the best entries into the genre and then evolved it at the same point in time, 20 years later after the PS1 and all of these games came out. So I'm really interested to dive into your inspirations like it's such a tight well-scoped little game you know and i mean that in the best of ways not in any kind of derogatory sense um and i'm really keen to hear about the process but why don't we start off adam give me the pitch for those folks who don't know actually what crow country is why don't you tell everyone who's listening what this wonderful game is that you've made so crow country is a classic style survival horror game somewhat similar to let's say resident evil and silent hill and it's set in an abandoned theme park called Crow Country, and it's um, the year is 1990, very specifically. Um, so, and maybe there's creepy things wandering around the park. Maybe there's a mystery about why the park has been shut down. You play as a young woman called Mara Forrest, who is um, some kind of police agent that's been sent in to find the missing owner. And so, you know, you're wandering around. It's a puzzle adventure game. There's a mystery, and it's a survival horror game because you're picking up ammo and shooting enemies and using health kits and there are save rooms and a lot of the tropes of, of classic survival horror are there, but we mix them with modern quality of life stuff as well so that we make it kind of palatable to, you know, your, your modern audiences. That's the idea anyway. And you would, I would probably not be amiss to say that folks who are familiar with Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and maybe even the aesthetics of Final Fantasy VII would be very at home and very sort of get, get a little pang of nostalgia with this, with Crow Country, right? Yeah, those three you named, there are the three pillars. Like there are bits okay. of, there are other things as well. But I was actually yes, wondering were there any else? Because there are some very obvious tells for each of those games, right? Like I think the mood and yeah. atmosphere of Silent Hill, but like yeah. even some of the elements like the menu and the the heart monitor from Resident Evil and stuff like that, and the characters obviously from Final Fantasy. But what you talk about those three, like let's maybe let's maybe start there and then Tom, I'm keen to jump to you afterwards about like the scope of the game and you know the ambition of it. But Adam, talk to me about how those three inspirations came about, why you wanted to explore that, and then any other kind of fringe ones that people may not realize that were Yeah, really sure. Ones. So, yes, I, I'd been replaying all the old PS1 survival horror games, and I just realized, oh, these are still very, very appealing and good and timeless. And also, you know, the first three Resident Evil games, people replay them every year because mm. they're just fun. And there's some secret source in those that has been lost. Modern Resident Evil is excellent. Like they are 10 out of 10 games, but there's some magic about the first three that is really special. So I was like, okay. And then I'm, I'm a big Silent Hill fan. I played Silent Hills, all of them. I played all of them. Um, and I just love them. So I was like, I want to make my own. Um, so with Resident Evil, Specifically, I think the biggest thing I took was the environment design from the first two games. So Resident Evil 1 has the Spencer Mansion and Resident Evil 2 has the RPD police department building. And both of those are really iconic and memorable locations. And it's it's more about the way they function on a video game level. They're basically like Metroidvania maps in the sense that you 
go past a bunch of locked doors and then loop back around later with new stuff and unlock the doors and the map slowly kind of unfolds. And I, I kind of isolated, I think, I think those locations are the reasons that the first two Resident Evil games are so appealing to me. And I think if you compare it with three, three is a bit looser. It's a bit more wishy-washy. You've got the city and then you've got lots of other bits and bobs, but it doesn't quite have that sense of place that the those two mm. locations had. So I loved that. And I just wanted to make my own. So, you know, the theme park became my my way to make a Spencer Mansion, basically. Um, and then with Silent Hill, Silent Hill is... Um, so I have a I have a mantra on this. So I like how horrible Silent Hill is, but I like how video gamey Resident Evil is. Um, and you know, by contrast, Silent Hill is slightly less video gamey, and Resident Evil is slightly less horrible. So my goal with Crow Country was okay, let's float it between the two, where it's a good amount of video gaminess, and also it's going to be dark and horrible and moody and heavy as well, and just try and get a bit of both. And that was my kind of Venn diagram of, of um, <laughs> inspiration. And I think I did land somewhere in between. And then Final Fantasy VII is purely an aesthetic thing. It's it's the chunky, low-poly character models that look like toys. It's the look of the pre-rendered style background, the, the way that you walk into a room and it feels like a little kind of decorated shoebox diorama. I love mm-hmm. that stuff. Decorating dioramas is kind of my secret calling. And I've, I've, video games is just an excuse to do that for me. Um, and also the way that the rooms float in a black void of, of black space is directly from Final Fantasy VII because I just love that. Um, so that's that's in Crow Country too. So like, yeah, those three are the main are the main inspirations for sure. A quick, a quick question on that on the shoebox dioramas is: Did you ever, you know, because something that's notably absent from playing those games um, and with your new, you know, your new iteration on the genre is a lack of fixed cameras. And fixed camera perspective. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever experiment with that, or was that just not even no. something that came to mind? No, it was always a third person game where the camera follows you, and then that was just my starting point because that's much easier to set up than anything more bespoke or more arty. Yeah. You know, I always say that actually fixed cameras is quite hard because you've got to make a bunch of decisions about where to put your camera, why. You know, every location in your game, if you have fixed cameras, it has to be the camera angles that you choose have to be visually appealing, functionally useful. Uh, they might have to create tension. They might have to show pickups. And it's a lot of thought process. It would be way easier for me to just say, the camera is always 45 degrees above the character and it follows her around. Mm-hmm. And then it was really just the fact that the environments ended up looking like pre-rendered Resident Evil backgrounds. Yeah. That they, there was this kind of duality of, oh, it looks like there should be a fixed camera but actually there never was and there never is. So it was just kind of an illusion that happened by accident, quite honestly. Mm. Interesting. It's funny, like you can just, I love those sort of decisions and the development process where you can just offload a bunch of work onto the player. <laughs> it's like they yeah. can choose the they can choose the camera. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah you move it around. You look, you look wherever you want to look, honestly. Yeah. And then I don't have to worry about framing the rooms. So I just let <laughs> the player do it. So Tom... This these early moments of Crew Country and its its inception, were you also there, like playing some of these games as well? Were both of you going through, or do you remember like a day when Adam was chatting to you on Discord about some mad idea? Sure. So I uh, never played uh, survival horror games as a kid. We never really played them as kids that much. It was yeah. you, you sort of came to the genre slightly later on when the PlayStation yeah. one had already gone past and I never had that experience. Um, but we certainly played final fantasy seven to death and eight and nine. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, early stages of crow country was Adam. It was, uh, I think you started during lockdown, right. Mm-hmm. For in 2020 as just something to do for fun. And mm-hmm. so I wasn't part of that process at all. Um, so when I first heard about this, it was Adam saying offhandly, oh, I'm making a survival horror game for myself. And I was like, cool. Okay. And then we didn't really talk much about it after that for a while. And then I think I saw some screenshots on Twitter. Like Adam didn't even show them to me. I was like, oh, that looks cool. Well done, Adam. (laughs) Carry on. Um, but you know, at the time we were, we were working on, uh, I guess I was working on Tangle Tower ports 
uh, mm-hmm. to yeah. other platforms, trying to get that up, you know, on PlayStation and Xbox for the first time. Right. So you're and- working. You're actually working. Adam <laughs> is yeah, working Adam Adam, Adam, Adam's <laughs> official job at the time was to support that process, but also sort of prototyping and cool. trying out new ideas to, to figure out what we might be doing next after I'd finished Tangle Tower Ports. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, and, and then as part of that process was learning how to do visual scripting. So programming without me using a, you know, sort of node based editor in oh, unity, uh, called, uh, it's gone it? now. Which one is Playmaker. it? Oh, Playmaker. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so learning that as part of the, okay, we need to prototype things process led to the ability to go away and make a whole game without me, mm. uh, which is fantastic because I think having a singular person design all the mechanics and all of the vision for the, the whole thing gives it that sort of auteur feel, which some games you can tell that it just the whole thing is so cohesive. Yeah. Um, and then I was able to come in, you know, at, at some point later down the line in 20, beginning of 2023, I think you started showing me some of it like in person properly. And you were saying, well, should we do something with this? Like, will you help me? get it ready to put up on itch as a free download or something, or, you know, charge yeah, $5 for it or whatever. And I was like, no, because we should do something with this. Like, this looks amazing. Like we, we should do something more. Um, and so I came on to help get it running optimally, uh, just naturally through the process of learning, learning 3D modeling really sort of, early stages stuff, learning programming for the first time. Uh, there were places where I could step in and improve performance. Mm-hmm. Um, not as many as you would think. It was honestly like op- cracking the thing open. It was incredibly impressive uh, underneath. <laughs> Proud older brother moment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, but I was able to, you know, sand off those edges of performance, get it running on consoles, which is not something Adam had ever done or could it, mm-hmm. could do at that, at that point. Yeah. Um, but I just spent a bunch of time getting Tangle Tower working on consoles, on, on new consoles. So we were able to bring it to PlayStation for that initial announcement in, in October 2023, where we we dropped the first trailer, but also a full demo. Because, you know, this game came to me largely fully formed. Like the story was written. The, the level design was mostly done. I think you were in the middle of art passes on all the rooms, like sure. getting them all up to scrap. And um, how long, Adam, had you been working on it up until this point? And was it kind of your sole project or were you, because Mermaid Mask you were developing concurrently as well, right? Like Yeah, so Mermaid Mask outcomes. was our official project. But it, was kind <laughs> of, it was kind of on hiatus because at least one of our team members wasn't ready to jump on. Um, and I didn't want to do too much without them. So I had this kind of officially sanctioned free time of, I shouldn't really be working on Mermaid Mask. So I'm, you know, supposed to be doing other things. And like Tom said, I, I taught myself Playmaker, which is, you know, visual scripting language, ostensibly so I could prototype to find the next snippet clips. Mm-hmm. And I made a hundred potential next snippet clipses. And um, none of them came to fruition. Most of them were, were nonsense. And it's just funny to me that after making a hundred puzzle platformer games, I ended up, the one that ended up getting made was a horror survival game. So I don't know what happened there. Um, I'm sorry. I've forgotten the question that I, that no, that's all right. how long were you, how long were you on it for? Before? Oh gosh. Like, so I, at least a on. year, maybe like two before Tom had his hands on it. There was a yeah, long right. period of me saying, I really should package this up so Tom can take a look at it. But that involved getting it on, you know, um, source tree and and cleaning it up and making it not an absolute nightmare because i really just made yeah, tell it myself me about, for the longest tell time. me about that process of like before you know tom said he was very impressed where was there the like the moment where you'd already cleaned your room but everything was stacked just stashed in the cupboard and you had to go in <laughs> properly yeah no pretty much like i'd never made a 3d game before i'd never made an action game before you know i'd never done 3d modeling before so i was aware that it was kind of held together with, with masking tape like and i still feel like it is and it's a miracle mm-hmm. that people 
can play it without it blowing up in their faces. But I was pleasantly surprised when Tom had his hands on it and seemed to not be, you know, completely outraged by the whole thing. Because I was <laughs> wait, waiting for that moment where he turns around and says, Adam, this is nonsense. This is never going to run on, on consoles. There's something fundamentally broken about it. But yeah. apparently it's okay. I guess, I guess I got away with it. <laughs> well, it was fa- it was really interesting because I recognized a lot of the programming decisions that that I had made in early stages as well, and they're not they're not right. bad decisions by any means. They they are like logical decisions to make when you have limited experience. Mm, and there sure. are, you know, th- that nowadays there are things that's like, oh, I would do this differently to make it ten percent better, but yeah, only yeah. But n- none of it was like oh, throw this out, like start again. I'll I'll rewrite this whole chunk of stuff, um, just because like this is terrible. I can do better. N- none of it was worth throwing out just to get that like cleaner sure. under mm. the, under the hood stuff. It was all perfectly functional and the game worked and ran and you could play it and what more can you ask from a game <laughs> yeah <I guess> so. <laughs> yeah what more do you what more do you want Tom? the man brought right. you a finished game yeah um okay and so usually you know you're working with i think what you were saying that you got up to six six of you or something on snipper clips right so you do work with mm-hmm. like a you know some a few team members you mentioned on mermaid mask you're waiting for someone to be freed up to be able to come yeah. on did this game end up just being the two of you and your composer was or did you actually have some other collaborators as well? Uh, yes, it was just the two of us and the composer Arkeroid. That that it like if you want to say the dev team of Crow Country, you could probably just name those three people. So yeah. it was quite interesting to go back to kind of almost our old style of just super small development, mostly mm-hmm. just me and Tom. And mm-hmm. it was just because normally we need people to do you know art and animation and sound design and other things, but this time I just kind of did it all myself. Um, so we both wore a lot of hats, which we grew up doing and we were experienced, experienced with, um, yeah. later down the road, we had a lot of support from Neon Hive, which is a PR and marketing, um, company. So right. they, they weren't on the dev team, but they absolutely like helped us out a lot with the launch. Yeah. So I never felt like we were kind of isolated, but yeah, it was, it was a tiny, tiny dev team. And so, Tom, you recognized pretty early on once you'd seen, you know, what Adam had packaged up and what he was working on, you know, that it deserved a proper release, that it, it shouldn't just, you know, be some little little hobbyist project that you throw out, you know, for like, um, you know, onto, onto itch for five bucks. When did you first get the sense that, because, I mean, it's a significantly successful game for what a three development team, you know, um, when did you when did you first get the inkling that it was going to be something that really resonated well with folks, not just in regards to like, oh, this looks cool. It looks like something I played when I was younger, but like, oh, I'm actually going to play this. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to tell my friends to buy it, you know? Sure. So those early Twitter screenshots, you know, I was seeing them for the first time, same as everyone else. And, but I was also able to see the response to them and it was a bigger response to those screenshots than to anything really we put out on Twitter before any of our games that had been announced or anything like that. People were hungry for it just from those screenshots, which started making me think, okay, there's something here. Like if, if, if these people can get excited just from seeing a single screenshot, not even in motion, you couldn't tell that it was not fixed camera. You couldn't, you couldn't tell that it was fully 3d, but it, it looked special and people recognize that. And But at the same time, you can't really trust, you know, it, it's not the full game. They're not seeing a video of it. They're not playing the, a demo of it. They're, they're just seeing a screenshot and people like getting excited. So it was always in the back of my mind that it, it could be something really special, but I didn't want to sort of believe it necessarily. Yeah. But then we announced the game. We put out a trailer. People could play it, could play the demo on uh, both, both Steam and PlayStation 5. And um, it was right before Halloween. It was the week before Halloween, so it was the perfect timing. Everyone was in a spooky mood. And it blew up far beyond our expectations. We, we, we had Neon Hive help at that point already to sort of get it out to the traditional press, uh, get, it, get the demo in the hands of some streamers and, and YouTubers, but it 
it went far beyond any of our expectations. You know, mm. they, they do this for a living and they, they were blown away by the response as well. So at that point, I think we both thought, right, this is, this is for real, for real, something yeah, we need to impact. dedicate. Right. <laughs> we need to dedicate maybe, maybe, I think up to that point, we were planning to sort of co-develop both Mermaid Mask and Crow Country simultaneously and just sort of gently let them both happen when they happen. But I think that was the point we switched to, okay, let's, you know, park, park most of our work on Mermaid Mask for a while. Uh, and, you know, other, other people were helping us make it in the background. So that was ongoing, mm -hmm. but we both switched to Crow Country almost full time for uh, up, up until release. So for the, for the following six, six months, yeah. um, right wow. up until the May launch. So that was definitely the moment we, we took it seriously much more than we had before. And Adam, there's something that I, you know, that actually, I think the element that surprised me most about the game, and to be honest, you know, like when you go into a game that is quote unquote, what some people would call like a D make or, you know, like, you know, paying homage to a PS1 game um, and, you know, of scope, I think the game runs with like, you know, you could finish it in six hours or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing that took me by surprise the most was the power of the narrative and the story and actually just how incredibly engaging and moving it was but not only that it um it had the hallmarks of like say a resident evil or a silent hill where you know especially in resident evil there's corporate interests and there's technology you know at, at the core of you know the horrors and everything as well talk me a little bit about through how the story came to you and how how much you sort of knew that to be a part of the magic that you were sort of trying to capture again, that the newer sort of, you know, Resident Evils or the newer versions of these survival horror games don't have? Was it something that you were trying to capture there or was the story, did the story come to you quickly? What was the process? I mean, it was a very just natural, organic process. It, it started with the mechanical, I, I want to make a horror video game. Yeah. And then it was, okay, what kind of setting would be fun? What kind of setting would be a cool, interesting setting? Okay, let's do an abandoned theme park. So I had that on day one, let's say, and there was no story. And then the next question was, okay, well, why would there be monsters? And then, so there's where you start writing your story because ultimately that's that's what it's going to be about is if there are monsters, why are there monsters? But I was very aware that, you know, um, Silent Hill 2, for instance, is held up as one of the biggest examples of best examples of video game storytelling. And it has a really good hook and a really good twist. And I was like, oh, it'd be great to have these things. Um, but no, I, I just, I kind of worked backwards from um, what kind of monsters do I want to see on the screen and why would they exist? And I also just wanted there to be a little cast of NPCs that you bump into along the way, because that's the, that's the trope of the genre. You know, oh, there's an injured guy, there's a businessman, there's a there's a, a sad person in a corridor. Just, you know, it's just what you have. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, there's going to be maybe five or six characters. I probably put too many in the game, honestly. Um, but it was a case of who are they? Why would they be there? And I just fleshed it out. Um, I, I wrote the whole thing just by feeling my way across the process. I never really sat down and I was like, oh, this is my vision for the narrative. Um the moment that it became important to me, the story was when I landed on the central idea of of the game, um, which is very specific to, you know, what's going on and the timeline. Um, and it's difficult to, you know, explain exactly what that is without spoilers. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was a moment where I landed on an idea that I really, really, really liked. And it's in reference to why they're monsters and why are they there and why do they look like that? And, why have they arrived on the 21st of March, 1988? That was very relevant to me. That's my birth date. That's when I was born. Um, so <laughs> that factors into it a great deal. And I basically, I just landed on this story that I became really quickly, really passionate about. And then it was a case of how can I best put it in the game? So I had a big list of things that you, objects you expect to find, characters you expect to find, notes you'd expect to find. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I just had my experience from making grimoire games and i used to write comics and stuff so i have some experience writing dialogue um but it wasn't like anything i'd done before it was it was a very feel my way through the process and hope for the best and honestly i'm amazed it came across as well as it did i feel like i just kind of got lucky at some point 
<laughs> um, you know, it, it's interesting that you do talk about that you had the you had the park, and then you sort of just came up with the story because, like, oh, what could the characters be? Because it does really feel like really well entwined with this sense of place. Like the the characters and the actual premise and everything feels really embedded in not just the place, but what you're doing and the puzzles and the context yeah. of things. A lot of the times. Tom, do you remember, you know, a lot of the times that can come from iteration further down the track. When you came on board, I know you've said that a lot of the game was there, but do you remember an iterative process towards the end or was it kind of just technically closing the game out? Or were you still, were you and Adam still like iterating on things majorly with whether it had to do with level design or story or mechanics or? Right. So when I, when I started seeing it, it was right around the time that it was be first presentable to people. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, intentionally adam adam got to this stage where he was happy to show it to people and so started showing it to people and not just me to other friends and then at some point uh, we were able to build out uh, a, a build of it for the first time um that that was fully playable through and uh, i i didn't actually play it fully until a little bit later uh mm -hmm. you know i was playing i was playing those early few stages Mm -hmm. uh, the, up here in the demo just to get a feel for it but i didn't play through the whole story until adam was really like solidly happy with the whole thing but we were able to send it to a few friends and and see and start gathering feedback for the first time like actual genuine playtesting feedback yep um so uh we, we there was definitely some iteration there mechanically speaking um adam's talked before about only adding the modern analog movement controls after some play testing feedback from someone, oh, cool. um, which is you know one of the, one of the nice features of it now that, that people sort of really like that you can use both tank controls and modern controls at the same time. Yeah. Um, but that was definitely a later iteration, uh, and just some some of the. Not necessarily the story beats, but sort of the way the story unfolds and, um, and elements to it. There were things that got added and, and, and taken away, but it, it was all sort of around that last ten percent, really. Yeah. A, a lot of the, a lot of the my favorite story beats did enter the game really late. My favorite character in the whole game is the is the police guy Harrison yeah. James, <laughs> who's kind of like a, a harmless like himbo, you know, police guy. <laughs> and I, he was added, I, I, I can't say at the last minute, but he was added very late. I was basically just like, oh, the real police guy should probably show up. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, that's a fun idea for a character. Let's get him in there. And it's a testament to the process that I was able to design him, model him, slap him in, write his dialogue, you know, in a matter of a week or two. And suddenly he was a really integral part of the emotional story of the game. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the most important iterations with the story and the characters and the script actually came from working with the composer, Ockroyd, who, because of the nature of the project, was very emotionally involved in what the story was and what the themes were and what the ending was and what was being said by the game and when and what was being left open and all these really important things. So they, for instance, played the, the original version of the ending, which was a bit different and had a lot of great feedback. So that was where a lot of the story iterations came from. And it was quite late in the process, honestly, that I, I feel like this whole thing just like scrambled into a really good shape very late in the day, which maybe that's how things go, but I'm very grateful that it did. Yeah. Well, that makes, that makes sense. You know, I think if you've got that opportunity, like I, it's, you know, I think Ken Levine's GDC talk from years ago, he spoke about how many people wanted to murder him because he was so late with his story all the time to the game, you know, like, and being a writer myself, writer, narrative designer, it's, I know the benefits of like leaving elements of the narrative as late as you possibly can. So you have those elements to work with, right? Like, I'm not saying come on right at the end, but you know, you, you're yes. there from the beginning, you've got the narrative and like putting in those elements because the detective, as you mentioned, it's just such a Mara wouldn't be anywhere near as strong, the protagonist Mara, but like wouldn't right. be as strong a character in any way, shape or form without him reflecting so many of her qualities and the journey that she's going on and everything through this too. Okay. It's, it's really, really quite phenomenal how much of a critical character he is and, you know, hearing how Lady came on in the process. So tell me about, 
because there's a lot to love about this video game. And I don't just mean like, you know, the game as a sum of its parts and what it ended up being, you know, and even what what Tom saw when you brought it to him. But talk to me now, looking back on the game and seeing that you're seeing the audience's response to it. What are some of your sort of little victories from the game? You know, like what are your little wins or things that you're very, you're quite particularly proud of, whether it be mechanics or the execution of some, you know, amorphous quality that you had to pin down and hone in on that these games had that you were trying to recreate? Um, the, the two moments that make me smile every time I watch a stream or a YouTube video, there's a moment towards the end where a character you think has died reappears in a kind of heroic return. Mm-hmm. And and people will will cheer for her, and it's like <laughs> it makes my heart melt every time. I'm like, oh, this works. People are happy about this character. They were sad that they thought she died. Here she is. It's so great. It's really hard proof that it's working. And then <laughs> on the other end of the spectrum, there's another moment that always makes me just so pleased uh, with the just the way the mechanical nature of the game is. So as you play Crow Country, traps start appearing in in the game world. Mm-hmm. like for chandeliers and bear traps and, you know, it's that kind of thing. And quite later on, there are these traps that are fake item boxes that are designed to look quite a bit like the med kits and the handgun ammo. Uh, but if you pick them up, they blow up and you take damage. And Mara goes, oh, it was an explosive. I better be careful. And just as a side note, those were actually inspired by Mario Kart, which has the same thing where the fake item box that you leave behind. Yeah. Anyway, th- there's a wonderful through line where you watch people play the game and it happens pretty consistently, which is, maybe someone will pick up the first two and they'll go, what? That's outrageous. I can't believe that. It was an explosive. That's crazy. And then they will learn what they look like. And then Mm. the last 10% of their playthrough, they're walking around going, that's fake. That's fake. That's fake. And it's so funny to me. It's like they've, they've mastered it. They've got it. They're, they're kind of giving back against the game, trying to hurt them. And they're kind of, it's just really satisfying. I had that exact experience and there's something beautiful about like, even when you get to the point where you're like, ha ha, not today, ammo case. Like, yeah. I'm aware. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're then like, you know, the classic, again, the survival horror trope of like running back and forth across levels being like, oh, I got it. I got the thing for that puzzle now. And you're sprinting and right. you like see a health pack or something and you just grab it because you're in a rush and, <laughs> and yeah. it gets you. And you're like, no, I know better. God, slow it down. Right. Come on. You know, that's my own fault. It's a really beautiful little loop there. It's great. Um, okay. Now, Tom, I'm interested to hear from your perspective now, looking back on the game and also as being someone who, you know, who came in quite late to the process, especially in like the inception of these mechanics. Like you said, he had most of them sort of figured out by the time you came on board. Is there something that you that you really resonate with? Or when you first looked at it, you were like, fuck, that's cool. Or Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, just the the look of the thing is so it, it's so weirdly piercingly nostalgic, but in a it, in a way that isn't just oh recreating things the way they were. It's like Adam lifted my memory of PlayStation games out of my head and showed them to me on the screen. <laughs> but it's such a weirdly personal thing. How did he do that? But I guess we all have this sort of experience of. Mm-hmm. It's been 20 years since the PlayStation 1 was around, almost. Uh, no, uh, more than 20. Oh, my God, I'm old. Um, <laughs> we don't talk about that, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's been a long time since the PlayStation was around, and uh, for most people, they haven't played a PlayStation 1 in a while. And so you, you, you're you remembering, I think I read somewhere that every time you remember something, you write over that memory with your remembering of the remembering. Huh. So as things fade into your past, they they change with every time you remember it and the framing you have at that point in your life. Huh. And so all of our older memories of games are always tinted by whatever we're doing at the time when we remember it. So it's definitely not a photographic memory of a PlayStation game. It's it's this strange filtered version filtered through five more generations of, of consoles. Mm. And then Adam just put that on screen. Um, the way I've described it is um, if you draw something from memory, your drawing will look like how that thing feels to you more than it'll look like the thing actually looks like. Yeah. So I was making Crow Country just by feeling my way across what I felt like it should look like. And we ended up with something that, <laughs> to use the word a lot, feels like a PlayStation 1 game. But actually, if you compare it, directly it doesn't actually match any of them one-to-one at all 
So, yeah. Do you, Tom, do you remember anything that you saw come on late or that you contributed to or Adam or even feedback, like you were saying, from the composer that really helped bring it even more in line with that? Like, you know, we were talking about characters um, coming in late, but were there any things that came in late that made it even feel even more like a PS1 game? Uh, not that I can think of. Um, the music definitely lifted it in that direction. Oh, yeah, right. I mean, the music definitely came on off. The, the composer came on after I came on. Um, yeah, cool. And yeah, like Ocaroid, the composer, absolutely matched that energy of this is definitely PlayStation 1, but it's not. The PlayStation 1 could never. And the the technology to do the to make these noises yeah. wasn't there at the time and now is but it never feels out of place with what you're looking at mm. um so yeah like 100 percent elevates it by by matching it perfectly um mm. and that was a really that was a really iterative process with you adam back and forth with ocaroid yeah um just sort of triangulating the vibe between the two of you yeah Ocaroid like the just first laid week down. they wrote like a hundred tracks right and it was like okay let's find what works and uh yeah triangulating is a good way to describe it because it was like putting stuff in the game seeing how it feels realizing that actually the music needs to be really minimal which is an interesting moment uh like oh melodies mostly don't have a place in this game except for maybe the occasional story beat or npc theme mm-hmm. um and just discussing discussing with Ocaroid the idea that the music should be as blurry as the graphics, where there's a sense of like a oh, hazy what a great way of putting sheen. It. Yeah, so that, that that happened immediately when they they showed me their samples, and it, it felt like the music was coming from like another room, where it was kind of behind a sheet or something. And I just thought this is exactly what the game feels like to look at. So there was an instant marriage of of those two things, and mm. yeah, obviously the music suits the game really well. It's a match made in heaven. Is there anything that you, you know, sort of last thing on this topic, because you, you know, the both of you and obviously a lot of the work and the thinking that you've put into it, Adam, and, you know, I think as well playing those, you know, coming back to those PS1 games later, obviously, is like, you know, it might give you an edge here as someone who'd worked on those actual games in the PS1 day or with those constraints back then, you know, might actually head off in the wrong direction trying to recreate it. What, give me some of your like little dirty hacks or your dirty tricks. Do you remember some things that came through where you're like, you know, they may not have even ever been possible on the PS1 or they're actually not anything that you see on the PS1 or those types of games, but they actually counterintuitively like helped you bring the bring the game more in line with that vibe, made it more like something feels as opposed to what it actually is like. So the main character, Mara, everyone, and, the, and all the characters, everyone says that they're low poly, right? That's, yep. that's the aesthetic people ascribe to her. But actually, her triangle count is higher than the PlayStation could ever push in total, ever. <laughs> and honestly, yeah. I think it, you, you'd you struggle to render her on a PS2. Um, yeah. She's she's deliberately these really smooth, like geometric shapes, sort of half spheres and cylinders and capsule shapes um, to, to get this very specific vibe but you need a, a high triangle count to get shapes looking that smooth mm-hmm. and to distinguish the characters from the background. And the, the background genuinely is largely low poly stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, if you actually look at her model, she's very dense, but deliberately so. And, and you know, yeah, amazing. It, it just works. Yeah, the, never be done. On the the main difference is that the characters don't have textures so they look kind of clean and simple huh. and the environments are very heavily textured. So they look more kind of gritty and, and complex. Um, yeah. But actually, yeah. So the characters are high poly and the backgrounds are low poly. I know it's, it's not what it looks like. But that's how I ended up. <laughs> Do you remember the Eureka moment, Adam, when it kind of started to feel like a PS1 survival horror game, feel like your, you know, your beautiful Venn diagram? Was there a final piece of the puzzle that kind of slotted in and you're like, oh my God, it's happening. Um. I, I think getting the map right and the feeling of like showing all the locked doors on the map, I know it's a simple thing, but that's a really important part of the, the gameplay. 
Um, once that felt correct, it really felt like a survival horror game. And also just the, the layout of, of the thing, like, oh, it's about unlocking doors. And that that was the most important thing, I think. I struggled with the combat for a long time. It wasn't fun. Maybe it still isn't. Um, it's kind of deliberately clunky. Some people are okay with that. Some people find it annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, but the moment it, it became super special for me was when we put the music in because it, it became like something that has, it felt like it always, always existed. Like, oh, it's yeah. real. Like Crow Country is, is a thing. It exists. It's beautiful. It's special. It's like, it should exist. It, yeah. So, um, for me, it's, it was adding the music that really lifted it into like, oh, okay, this is really a big deal now. All right, last Crow Country question. Then I want to, because I really do want to just finish up with talking about the Mermaid Mask and the Grimoire series. Puzzle design. Puzzle design is so central to this game. You know, like you're you're constantly engaging with these puzzles, running across a map, picking up fake, <laughs> fake ammo packages on your way from one thing yep. to another. Um, I feel like, and I've actually read you know, some interviews where you talk about this, like the the puzzle design is really well balanced where you don't really feel super stumped at any point in time. You do feel like, okay, if I don't pull out my phone and I do think about this, sit here for a good two minutes, or if I come back to it later, or maybe I'm going to encounter the answer to this thing further on in the game. Like you do have faith that, you know, nothing is kind of out of your wheelhouse. Tell me a little bit about honing in on the puzzle design for this game and finding that that sweet balance that I know you've spoken about before and I definitely felt in the game and how how kind yeah. of central that was to executing on this concept. I think if you look at our career, and we've joked before that we keep changing genres, I think the puzzle design is the most consistent through line because most of the games we've made, whether it's Snipperclips or Tangle Tower or Crow Country, are puzzle games. And with Snipperclips in particular, I designed most of the levels for that game. So it was kind of a crash course in puzzle design and how to visually communicate ideas wordlessly to your players and all this. So I came out the back of Snipper Clips, a much stronger puzzle design. I quite, I became quite confident. And then with Tangle Tower as well, lots and lots of puzzles. So it's, it's kind of my one thing that I would say, okay, yes, I can do this. I like doing this. I have lots of ideas for puzzles. I enjoy designing them. I enjoy that process of trying to communicate them to the player. And it's also the thing that I look for in survival horror games. And I'm, I'm disappointed if I don't get good puzzle design. So it was it was the most important like pillar of the gameplay for me. Um, and it really started with, okay, you've got items and you've got locked doors and the items unlock the locked doors. And it was just a case of how can I make each one memorable and interesting? How can I make each door memorable? How can I make each room interesting? Um, and I would just iterate on them. So many puzzles I just chucked out because they weren't that fun or interesting and I would just dream up something else. Lots of puzzles didn't exist until later in the process. Like the arcade, famously, you didn't play the arcade games for ages. And then one day I just couldn't take it anymore. And I thought you have to be able to play the arcade games. And if I'm <laughs> going to do that work, it needs to be a puzzle. Otherwise it's a waste of time for me. So <laughs> that went in there. And now it's my favorite. I think my favorite puzzle in the whole game is the mermaid quiz machine where all the answers are wrong in 2024, but correct in 1990. I think that's really fun. <laughs> um, that was a that was a good one. A good Twitter thread got me some of those suggestions. So thanks everybody. Oh, yeah, it really is just iteration. It's like you put it in, you you put in the hints you think people need, and then you watch people play, and you you catch when they get stuck, and then you, you put a few more hints in, or you take some hints out. If you see someone's wandering around and not knowing where to stand, you put little footprints on the ground, or you put an arrow or something, and it's just back and forth until you think it's in the right place. And then we always joke that. The best outcome you can hope for with puzzle design in terms of getting the difficulty right, in terms of balancing it, is an equal number of people complaining that the puzzles are brain dead and too easy and people complaining that the puzzles are a nightmare and, <laughs> and too hard. And and very few people will stop and say, oh, the puzzles were bang on in the center, well done. But instead you'll have 50 people on one side and 50 on the other and then you go, yes, I've got it right. Yeah, because so, the um, silent majority are just tearing through the puzzles. Yeah, being challenged exactly. It is the silent majority. Although people have been quite kind about the puzzles in Crow Country, for sure. But yeah, I think we have balanced it just purely on the fact that I see an equal number of people saying, Crow Country is good, but the puzzles are really easy. And Crow Country is good, but the puzzles are really annoying. Um, so thanks, everybody. I'll take that. Well, guys, you know, I'm a massive fan of what you've done. And, I think, you know, something that's been a sort of a hallmark of my career and a, and a challenge that I really love is sort of like a, a creative lead that I can find myself being drawn to all the time is this question of pastiche. 
you know, and like looking at various things, whether it be, you know, like Red Dead Redemption wants to do like a cowboy, slow cowboy serial or like how do you, how do you, you know, take a hundred hours and, you know, make it feel like it should feel as people remember it or whether it's a survival horror game that takes six hours, how do you, how do you recreate that feeling that people, the memory of a memory of a memory, right? Like as you were saying, Tom, and you've just, you've just nailed it so well. And I, and it really is, as I was saying to you before we kicked off the podcast, Adam, it's kind of feels like the fruits of your labor over the last 20, 25 years or something, right? Like making, yeah, making so. games together that you're, you're able to sort of nail this execution on this title and this concept. Yeah. We've, we've just basically developed taste and, you know, design sensibilities. We like a big part of my job is guessing how someone's going to feel when they look at something and mm-hmm. anticipating um, thoughts ahead of time and, and making sure your game, you know, isn't going to annoy people or distract people. And all those, you can only get that through experience by experiencing it, you know, in real time. And so, yeah, like, like I said, going back to Newgrounds, we've made hundreds of games mm. and we're at that point now where I, I sort of know what I'm doing and we know what's going to work, what isn't, what's worth pursuing and what isn't. Um, but only, only sort of recently do I feel like this kind of confidence, I think, mm. having made a couple of games that were quote unquote successful. I don't know how you feel, Tom, if you feel like there's a point where we've sort of hit our stride and now, now we know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, we've, we've, our last three have been increasingly successful for us just in general. I mean, Snip Eclipse was an outlier. You can't, you can't factor in Nintendo marketing prowess that that's <laughs> own thing, but our, our own sort of last three titles in, in Haunt the House and then Tangle Tower and then Crow Country have been sort of climbing up the ladder of, of, of success. And I think that is down to us hopefully continuing to improve at what mm. we do. Um, even, even after 20 years of doing it. So yeah, yeah. But that's it now. We've plateaued. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm chasing the high. Yeah. I, I, I'm chasing the high of Snipper Clips for the rest of my life. Like that game design is too pure and too good. And it's it's impossible to create something as simple and appealing as that. So yeah. that's my albatross for but, the rest of my life. Right. But, you know, Tang- so Tangle Tower started out before Snipper Clips. So we were already making that. But so Crow Country is really the next thing that we released that entirely started after snipper clips and there's always the question no. of what do you do as a as a second album after a big success <laughs> and the answer is make something different you know, yeah. you know start start painting instead like just shift yeah. genres completely because uh and we're going to keep doing it too i've got like two or three other genres that i really want to hit okay okay same. so uh, yeah look watch this <laughs> all right I love it. It's fantastic advice because, you know, it is especially for a lot of, you know, in the industry that we live in, like indies can, can you know, be cruising along forever long and then just strike big. And then obviously yeah. the expectation is that you do it again or, you know, there's that pressure that you may place on yourself. So the advice of just, you know, blow out the cobwebs by actually doing something completely different, you know, leave that, leave the pressures behind and just pivot entirely is wonderful. Now, I do want to talk about pivoting and like different genres. There is one hallmark sort of through your, through your game dev careers. I mean, what detective grimoire was 2010, was it? 2000. uh, Yeah. 2000. Yeah. 2010 for the flash game. That's right. And then. Okay. And so let's maybe, maybe Tom, you can talk a little bit about detective grimoire and tangle tower. You've got the mermaid mask coming up. Tell, fill our listeners in for those who may not be aware that SFB is even making these games as well as Crow Country and Snipper Clips and everything. What What is the Detective Grimoire series? Sure. So one of the secret sources of Adam and I working together is being brothers, we grew up playing exactly the same games because we shared consoles. And even later on, you know, we, we had the same consoles. We grew up with the same taste and we sort of have this reference library in our heads of the same games. And one of those games that both of us really latched onto was the Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney series. We loved those games when they finally came to the West. Um, and it looked like the kind of game that we might be able to, at least the 
detective section where you're investigating crime scenes looked like something that we could maybe achieve in Flash at the time. So we did. We we decided to go and make a detective game very much in that vein of first person, static screen, detective point and click adventure game where you're not walking around as a character. You're just looking at a scene and then moving to the next scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the, the first Flash game was... was a very rough idea of that. Um, those voice acting was just characters going, <laughs> um, you know, Adam, Adam wrote a little mystery and we, we had a little interrogation mechanic where you had to look someone in the eyes at the right time. And we were just sort of trying our hand at it, but people responded to it. People liked it because other people were playing Ace Attorney and loving it. So, they were hungry for more and here was this little flash game that they could play for 20 minutes and get more of that experience. And I think we both really enjoyed making it. Um, and it did well enough for Armor Games that they then suggested making this mobile sequel that ended up being the Kickstarter that I talked about earlier. Um, that ended up taking longer than we thought for all, all sorts of reasons, but eventually did come out as another game called Detective Grimoire it had a subtitle secret of the swamp but we just most people know it as detective grimoire and it was a it was a soft reboot where we didn't really want people to know about the original flash game anymore <laughs> um adam had gone away to university and gone from uh, like good art to greater art he did illustration animation at university so you know four years of intense study of character design and art in general is just obviously going to improve someone's work. Um, so we came out of it with, uh, you know, it came out on, on PC and we, we did put it out on mobile as well. Um, eventually. And people really liked that one too. It was, uh, it was the first game we released as SFB games. We, we sort of formed SFB games in the middle. Um, I guess I guess Haunt the House came out slightly before that on PlayStation Mobile, but it was the first game we launched on Steam, right. um, and mm-hmm. on, and certainly the first game we launched on on app stores as well. And yeah, people really responded to it and really enjoyed it. And it was uh, a, a much bigger mystery, but still fairly tight. How how long would you say that one is? I'm um, like three, four hours, something like that. At max, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, there was a cast of, of suspects and, uh, and a murder victim and a mystery solve and puzzle mini games sort of in the vein of uh, Professor Layton. A lot of people yeah. sort of say that this is a game where you mix Professor Layton and Phoenix Wright. And then that game came true later on. <laughs> they actually went and made that, the Mad Men. Yeah, what a um, compliment as well. It reminds right. me of a, a snipper clips compliment that I saw you getting a lot of the time around the release, and which honestly I thought too, um, until I realized that it wasn't Nintendo making the actual game, that it was you guys, right? Like what a compliment to be played, paid that yeah, like honestly, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. snipper clips is or even that, you know, your detective grimoire is like these two games that you love being right. smashed together into one. It's like, right. Yeah. And that was obviously our intent, but the fact that it came through was fantastic. Yeah. Like I'm so glad people got what we were going for. Mm. Um, and it did well enough for us that, that we wanted to make more. We, again, we, it's the kind of thing we enjoy making. It was a good mix of both of our skills and just sort of pushed us a little bit into more story writing things. It was the first game that really had a story. The flash game, right. was the first game that really had a, proper story to it um and so adam found that he enjoyed writing that sort of thing enough to want to do it again at least one one more time um and never stopped (laughs) and um yeah and we 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 right away we knew we wanted to make another one and we ended up sort of starting a an idea generation process and we ended up getting some european arts funding to go away and make the next grimoire game in the series, Tangle Tower. Um, and then Big Daddy Nintendo just absolutely stomped all over our plans there by us accidentally lucking into this development Super cycle. And we had to put it on a shelf for a while because, of course, you, you know, Nintendo says, let's make this game, let's make it now, let's make it in time for Switch launch, you just drop everything. So we paused all of that development for, what, two years-ish, 
um, mm. and picked it up again afterwards. And luckily, the you know Catherine Unger was on the Tangle Tower team, but also on the Snipper Clips team. So she hadn't gone anywhere. She she'd been working with us <laughs> the whole time. We never let her leave. Either. I know. We were like, <laughs> okay, and now you're back on Tangle Tower again. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So she was able to continue with us there and um, the music had already been done, I think, before Snowclips even started. Raphael yeah. uh, Benjamin Weyer is the composer out in Switzerland. Um, just absolutely smashed that. It was amazing. We got to see it recorded in Budapest by the Budapest Art Orchestra, which was surreal and special. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and then that eventually came out in 2019 on various things. And again, this is another one of these uh, experiences where we started talking to Apple about the fact that we were making this thing and wanted to put it on mobile. And they said, oh, we have this upcoming platform, Apple Arcade. <laughs> I don't suppose you fancy putting it on there, do you? And we were like, oh, yeah, sure, okay, that sounds good. And then suddenly we had a deadline and needed to localize into 17 languages and yeah, <laughs> but it was good for us. It was really good for us because we didn't have a deadline up to that point. We we're just sort of making it fairly solidly, but not rushing anything or, you know, making it fairly humanely. But I think it would have taken six months longer to finish it. Just doing it ourselves. We could have easily languished a bit in that last period yeah, of, sure. of development whereas having a deadline to get to was like okay we need to get serious about this and just get it done and here are the cuts we need to make and here are the yeah. you know like let's let's make this the best version of itself by really honing in on and we just spent two years doing that process with nintendo so yeah. i think we learned about that sort of you know kill your babies make sure the thing comes out the best it can without being bloated experience. Yeah. So mm. it was, we were perfectly timed to do it. And so Adam, now the mermaid mask, why don't you fill everyone in on the mermaid mask? And then we can talk a little bit about how you've decided to do for a, for a studio, a couple of brothers that are jumping around each game being different than the last, this is yeah. your third iteration in the series. So fill us in on what the mermaid mask is and then, how it sort of came about doing jumping into that. Thing. So the Mermaid Mask is the first time we've made a Detective Grimoire game where we didn't throw everything out the window and start from scratch. It's the first time we've <laughs> made one that I would be comfortable calling a sequel because Tangle Tower was good and successful and popular. And I still like the way it looks. I haven't grown away from that look. So we were like, we're able finally to say, okay, we've got the engine. We've got a lot of the artwork. You know, we've got the composer, the artist, the animator, all these people in, in the team. Let's just make the next one. And it was the first <laughs> time we were able to do that. And it was such a, a relief. And we, we just took the Tangle Tower project and sort of gutted it and made a blank version. And then we just started filling in the blanks. Um, so when we were making Tangle Tower, we knew we were writing a larger story that wasn't being fully wrapped up. And there's bigger mysteries and there's, you know, lore and there's world building we, we try and keep that stuff mostly in the background, but it was inevitable that there was more to do. So we were like, okay, um, Catherine and I really want to write the next game. And the, uh, the, the sort of central creature at the heart of Tangle Tower was a very tiny insect. So the, the first decision I made for the next game was I want it to be about something massive this time. So let's set it in the ocean. I love uh, Jules Verne books. I love... Um, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, mm -hmm. let's do a, a spooky submarine just because what better location than a submarine to have a locked room mystery where all the characters are unable to leave. Um, so yes, The Mermaid Mask is a murder mystery detective adventure game set in a very strange submarine called the Mortuga submarine, which is closer to the Nautilus than any real life submarine. You know, it's, it's not <laughs> a military submarine. It's a, a weird Gothic space for weirdos to hide in the ocean um and yeah it was just a long process of pre-production of okay what kind of characters do we want what kind of settings I, I spoke before about crow country where you start with just the settings and like what where do you want it to set and these games are kind of similar in that you start off with what do you want to see on screen like what kind of weird characters do you want to see what kind of weird locations do you want to see 
And once you have a few ideas that you're keen on, you sit down and go, okay, let's write a story that involves these things. So really it was, um, why would there be, what kind of murder mystery would you have under the ocean? Who, who would the murder victim be? And, and so on. Um, and it's a little darker than Tangle Tower, I think. It's a little more complex than Tangle Tower. Um, but I think it's going to be pretty amazing. Every time I play it, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is this is great. Because we had about six months where we didn't touch it because we were full-time on Crow Country. Yeah. And then coming back to it, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, this is amazing. We hired a 3D modeler for the first time to do all the clues in 3D so you can spin them around, which is a big leap because it, now it means that the clues have hidden things inside them and underneath them and around the back of them and you can do games involving that so mechanically it's the same as tangle tower but mechanically it's a lot more complex than tangle tower as well awesome it does look incredible like the 3d objects it's it's funny what it does for you know a license it's classically 2d like giving that other dimension to it and those things popping out like these little hero props as you would call them in film or tv yeah. right like having this little moment of them themselves this different treatment it's great stuff well really exciting gentlemen it's been absolutely absolutely fascinating talking to the both of you like i said when chatting about crow country i'm just you know and i don't want to make out like it's the peak and everything's you know <laughs> downhill from now i mean it's just really exciting like after 20 years of making games you know i was mentioning the ira glass classic monologue to you adam before the podcast kicked off about like mm. the gap between taste and execution and you know after 20 years of hard work and hundreds of games it really feels like you two are really out there like swinging with all your might and getting some home runs like they're just these really exceptional games i'm super keen on the mermaid mask um having played the first two in crow country so i wish awesome. you all the best and thank you so much for being so forthcoming with your process and everything thank you that's today. very kind of you thank you so much awesome all right have a great day thank you very much you too thanks for having us it's been a pleasure